This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Carl Manchester, 2007. God and the State by Mikhail Bakunin. Chapter 2, Part 2. The State will no longer call itself monarchy. It will call itself republic. But it will be none the less the State, that is, a tutelage officially and regularly established by a minority of competent men, men of virtuous genius or talent, who will watch and guide the conduct of this great, incorrigible and terrible child, the people. The professors of the school and the functionaries of the State will call themselves republicans but they will be none the less tutors, shepherds, and the people will remain what they have been hitherto from all eternity. A flock. Beware of shearers, for where there is a flock, there necessarily must be shepherds also, to shear and devour it. The people in this system will be the perpetual scholar and pupil. In spite of its sovereignty, wholly fictitious, it will continue to serve as the instrument of thoughts, wills, and consequently interests not its own. Between this situation and what we call liberty, the only real liberty, there is an abyss. It will be the old oppression and old slavery under new forms, and where there is slavery there is misery, brutishness, real social materialism among the privileged classes as well as among the masses. In defying human things the idealists always end in the triumph of a brutal materialism. And this for a very simple reason. The divine evaporates and rises to its own country, heaven, while the brutal alone remains actually on earth. Yes, the necessary consequence of theoretical idealism is practically the most brutal materialism, not undoubtedly among those who sincerely preach it the usual result as far as they are concerned being that they are constrained to see all their efforts struck with sterility but among those who try to realize their precepts in life and in all society so far as it allows itself to be dominated by idealistic doctrines to demonstrate this general fact which may appear strange at first but which explains itself naturally enough upon further reflection historical proofs are not lacking compare the last two civilizations of the ancient world the Greek and the Roman. Which is the most materialistic, the most natural in its point of departure, and the most humanly ideal in its results? Undoubtedly the Greek civilization. Which, on the contrary, is the most abstractly ideal in its point of departure, sacrificing the material liberty of the man to the ideal liberty of the citizen, represented by the abstraction of judicial law, and the natural development of human society to the abstraction of the state, and which became nevertheless the most brutal in its consequences. The Roman civilization, certainly. It is true that the Greek civilization, like all the ancient civilizations, including that of Rome, was exclusively national and based on slavery. But in spite of these two immense defects, the former nonetheless conceived and realized the idea of humanity. It ennobled and really idealized the life of men, it transformed human herds into free associations of free men. It created, through liberty, the sciences, the arts, a poetry, an immortal philosophy, and the primary concepts of human respect. With political and social liberty, it created free thought. At the close of the Middle Ages, during the period of the Renaissance, the fact that some Greek emigrants brought a few of those immortal books into Italy sufficed to resuscitate life, liberty, thought, humanity, buried in the dark dungeon of Catholicism. Human emancipation, that is the name of the Greek civilization. And the name of the Roman civilization? Conquest, with all its brutal consequences. And its last word? The omnipotence of the Caesars, which means the degradation and enslavement of nations and of men. Today even, what is it that kills, what is it that crushes brutally, materially, in all European countries, liberty and humanity? It is the triumph of the Caesarian or Roman principle. Compare now two modern civilizations, the Italian and the German. 
The first undoubtedly represents in its general character materialism. The second, on the contrary, represents idealism in the most abstract, most pure, and most transcendental form. Let us see what are the practical fruits of the one and the other. Italy has already rendered immense services to the cause of human emancipation. She was the first to resuscitate and widely apply the principle of liberty in Europe, and to restore to humanity its titles to nobility. Industry, commerce, poetry, the arts, the positive sciences, and free thought. Crushed since by three centuries of imperial and papal despotism, and dragged in the mud by her governing bourgeoisie, she reappears today, it is true, in a very degraded condition in comparison with what she once was. And yet how much she differs from Germany. In Italy, in spite of this decline, temporary, let us hope, one may live and breathe humanly, surrounded by a people which seems to be born for liberty. Italy, even bourgeois Italy, can point with pride to men like Mazzini and Garibaldi. In Germany, one breathes the atmosphere of an immense political and social slavery, philosophically explained and accepted by a great people with deliberate resignation and free will. Her heroes, I speak always of present Germany, not of the Germany of the future, of aristocratic, bureaucratic, political and bourgeoisie Germany, not of the Germany of the proletaires, her heroes are quite the opposite of Mazzini and Garibaldi. They are William I, that ferocious and ingenious representative of the Protestant God, Messrs. Bismarck and Moltke, Generals Mantafel and Werder. In all her international relations, Germany, from the beginning of her existence, has been slowly, systematically, invading, conquering, ever ready to extend her own voluntary enslavement into the territory of her neighbours. And since her definitive establishment as a unitary power, she has become a menace, a danger to the liberty of entire Europe. Today Germany is civility, brutal and triumphant. To show how theoretical idealism incessantly and inevitably changes into practical materialism, one needs only to cite the example of all the Christian churches, and naturally, first of all that of the Apostolic and Roman Church. What is there more sublime in the ideal sense, more disinterested, more separate from all the interests of this earth, than the doctrine of Christ preached by that church? And what is there more brutally materialistic than the constant practice of that same church since the 8th century, from which dates her definitive establishment as a power? What has been, and still is, the principal object of all her contests with the sovereigns of Europe? Her temporal goods, her revenues first, and then her temporal power, her political privileges. We must do her the justice to acknowledge that she was the first to discover in modern history this incontestable but scarcely Christian truth that wealth and power, the economic exploitation and the political oppression of the masses, are the two inseparable terms of the reign of divine ideality on earth. Wealth consolidating and augmenting power, power ever discovering and creating new sources of wealth, and both assuring, better than the martyrdom and faith of the apostles, better than divine grace, the success of the Christian propagandism. This is a historical truth, and the Protestant churches do not fail to recognise it either. I speak, of course, of the independent churches of England, America and Switzerland, not of the subjected churches of Germany. The latter have no initiative of their own. They do what their masters, their temporal sovereigns, who are at the same time their spiritual chieftains, order them to do. It is well known that the Protestant propagandism, especially in England and America, is very intimately connected with the propagandism of the material commercial interests of those two great nations, and it is also known that the objects of the latter propagandism is not at all the enrichment and material prosperity of the countries 